What's up, family? Thank you for tuning in to the Dream Nation podcast. My name is Casanova. I'll be your host, and I'm excited to be bringing to you entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and trailblazers from around the world. Stay locked in with us because we're about to go on a journey that will change your life. What's up, Dream Nation? We are back again with another episode that I'm sure will spark some ideas into your mind and hopefully spark some conviction into your heart. Today on the show, we have the wonderful, the amazing artist, Mr. Jeff Goings. Jeff, want to go ahead and say what's up to Dream Nation? Hey, Casanova. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Man, it's a pleasure to have you on. Now, for many of people who don't know you, you have been now featured in many publications. You wrote at least five books. Is that right? Yep. Five books. Wow. So I always like to make sure that I could give the proper introduction so everybody knows who exactly that they're listening to and getting inspired by. And I always like to think of us as entrepreneurs and also artists as superheroes. And the reason why is because we're constantly putting on a cape and we're trying to solve problems in the world, whether that be our own or other people. So before you became a best-selling author, before you became a world-renowned speaker, let's take it back to when you were just a young boy and tell me who is Jeff Goins? I thought you were going to ask me what my favorite su- superhero was. So I was bracing for that answer, yeah. Sp- Spider-Man. Yeah, you know, I'm somebody who's always made things, although I never would have thought of myself as an artist or even as a, as a writer. I was talking to my kid who's eight now the other day, and I said, buddy, this was maybe a couple of years ago, he was six. I said to him something, I said, you're so creative because he's always drawing something. He makes his own comic books and sells them. He's a bit of an entrepreneur too. And yeah. I said, you're so creative. He was six. He goes, what does that mean? I said, you know, like you just like make things and, and draw pictures and make up songs and create things. And he's like, oh, I thought everybody did that. Mm-hmm. And I can relate to that so much because, you know, what it was Picasso who said, we're all born artists. And so as a kid, you know, I was this shy you know, red haired boy who was never very popular, cool. I didn't play sports, always had lots of feelings that I didn't feel like I could really express. And so I would make things. I would put on little plays for my parents, you know, with stuffed animals. I would write songs. I would draw Garfield comics and and share them with my friend. I would draw Garfield. He would draw Odie and we would, you know, make these little comic strips together. And I think my whole life, this is true today, I've always wanted to make things and then share them with people. And the way that that's taken shape through the work that I've done, whether that was as a marketing director at a nonprofit, as a professional musician, as an actor, uh, or as an author today, or even an online entrepreneur, those are all just kind of variations of the same kind of work, which is I use my creativity to make things and then share them in a way that hopefully uh, transforms other people. When was the moment that you knew, because we all have this passion that we want to be able to make this world a better place, right? Whether it's online or offline. And you said, and a lot of people struggle with that, whether it's building relationships or whatever it might be, just expressing themselves and expressing what their passion and their creativity is. Was there one defining moment where you made a piece of art, whether it be, you know, whatever it was, that someone else gave you a response that either fueled you to do it even more or let's use that, that fueled you to do it even more? Yeah, there's been a bunch of moments like that, as I imagine, you know, there has been in your life. I think that every story of success is really a story of community. So in America, we love this idea of the self-made man or the self-made woman. And I love that. I love the the self-reliance, the ambitious, determined, I'm going to do this. And I think that drives a lot of us to succeed. I also think it would be dishonest of me to not point out all the people that helped me connect the dots and encouraged me when I was discouraged and gave me a piece of advice or an opportunity or opened a door. And if that didn't happen, I wouldn't be here today. And so there's all these moments that when I look back, I go, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And I like what Parker Palmer says about this, who's uh, he's a Quaker activist author. Uh, he says that before I can tell my life what I want to do with it, I need to listen to my life telling me who I am. Uh, And what that means to me is I need to pay attention to all the moments, all the people, all the voices in my life that were helping guide me to where I needed to end up. And so one of the first voices was a woman named Mrs. Koontz, who was my 
senior high school English teacher, my, my senior uh, high school English teacher. And she was notorious for being hard on students. Like if you got straight A's your whole life and you got into her class, you were getting a B minus, hmm. right? Like she, she ruined your GPA, right? And, <laughs> and I, was, I always just coasted through English classes. My mom used to read me the dictionary, which I thought was like a totally normal thing, you know? Like spell this word. Spelling was very important to her. When I was in sixth grade, I won the school spelling bee. The winning word was acquiescence. I made an eighth grader cry, which was the only time that ever happened. I was this little short pudgy kid. And I was like, I made an eighth grader cry. I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> so like English was easy for me and I get into her class and it's hard mm. and I actually have to work at it. Like I just, it was the first time where it wasn't an easy A. I mean, I, I had to work at other classes, but like English was always easy. Yeah. And so she assigns this assignment that ends up being like a third of our grade and it's one assignment. And if you, if you don't do this assignment, like you're kind of, you're screwed, you know? So you had to read a book. And then do like, I don't know, like an annotated bibliography where basically you had to research all of these books that were about this book. And it was a bunch of work that I didn't want to do. So right. I write, yeah, pull an all-nighter. I don't read the book. I, I write this 15-page, 20-page uh, paper, which in high school is a big deal. And, and then I turn it in. And, and then everybody gets their papers back a few weeks later. This is the last week of school. Like, and if you don't, past this class, you're not graduating. Right. And, and on all these, you know, everybody gets their papers back and I get my paper back and everybody's like flipping to the back to look at the grade and they're getting C's and D's and B minuses and nobody gets an A. And I'm like really nervous. And, and I flip to the back and there's and the whole thing is marked up with red, you know, all these red underlines and cross and like, she does not like this, this the, like all kinds of corrections being made. And I flip to the back and it says, next time, try reading the book. However, there's lots of good writing here. There's good thinking. You should seriously consider being a professional writer or a journalist, A minus. <laughs> and I was like, oh, phew. <laughs> it was like a 92 right. or something. And, you know, like that was significant to me. But I ended up like putting that paper away. And uh, a year later when I was in college, I was like having one of those existential crises, like what do I do with my life kind of thing? I have to figure everything out. And I remember opening the glove compartment to my car and that paper was still in there. And I pulled it out and I, I reread it, you know, and I cried. And I like, I felt seen in that moment. And I understood, and it would be years later, be a decade later before I ever became a professional writer. But those words stuck with me because I realized I had a gift. I had a skill that not everybody had. I could write a paper without reading a book and still get an A on it. And, and that really helped. Even today, like I, I understand that, what does Derek Sivers say? What's obvious to me is amazing to others. Mm -hmm. And I try to not take that for granted. Like if you see something in the world differently from, from the way other people see it and you, and you notice that nobody else sees that, like that's significant. And writing, words, communication, language, saying things with beautiful words to create change in people, that's always been something that I've been able to do. And I don't know that I ever would have known it were it not for those words that she wrote on that paper. Wow. And that's, man, there's so much to unpack there. And, and the first thing is, you know, when we talk about someone searching for their gift, right? And it's what comes easy for you. This is something that I always say, what comes easy for you and harder for others. And that's the same thing that you just said, which I think yep. is very significant. Yes. The, the thing that struck me out is I saw a video that you did, and this was maybe about two or three years ago. Oh, wow. And basically you were saying that, you know, you were at a seminar and someone had asked like how many people here have a dream or know their dream and to not butcher it, want to go ahead and, and tell this story again. Yeah, this is a story that I tell in a book called The Art of Work, which might align well with your audience, just a book about finding your dream, your purpose, your calling. And so, so that happens with my English teacher. This is my story, right? That happens with my English teacher. I go to college. I major in Spanish, not English. I still didn't get the message. You know, a dream, I think sometimes is something that you run away from long enough that you get so tired, it catches up to you and kind of tackles you to the ground and you go, okay, fine, I'll do this. This will be right. my life's work. Like that's how I experience. Do you, I think, dream, do you think your dream and your calling are the same thing? 
I think we use a lot of words to often talk about the same thing. And so I'm not so concerned with whether you use the term dream, passion, life's work, calling. What I think is true is most human beings that I talk to feel like they're here to do something. And I believe that you will spend your life unraveling that and making meaning and understanding it. And it's, it's not a job. It's not uh, a role. It's not just to exist or survive. We're all here to do something something significant. Uh, so whatever word you want to use is fine. And, and I think, you know, a dream is slightly different from a calling from a purpose. But at the end of the day, like, when I say those words, and something kind of wells up in you, like, listen to that good things come from that place where you go, yes, I got to do something that makes a difference that serves the world that lights me up that brings joy and, and meaning and life to other people. And I'm, and I'm spending my whole life trying to figure out what that is by listening and paying attention to the things that happen in my life. So I go to college, I major in Spanish, I graduate college, I end up joining a band. So I have all these like weird random things, right? I tour the country uh, with a rock band for a year, spend a month in Taiwan, we were huge in Taiwan, that was a whole other fun experience. And I always thought I wanted to play professional music. And I do this for a year. And I realize, you know, that's not that's not really the thing. I end up moving to Nash. I quit the band. I moved to Nashville, which is the opposite order that those things tend to happen in. I get a job working at a nonprofit. I become the marketing director there, working with an international relief and development organization, a missions organization. And, and then while I'm there, I am learning about writing, online marketing, et cetera. And I do this job for about five or six years. And I start to feel an itch, an internal itch that I can't quite scratch. There's a sense of like, there's more. I have a good job. I'm doing something meaningful and there's more. And I feel guilty about it. So I start reading books. I start searching for you know, the way to scratch this itch. And I go to a seminar. I go to a workshop about finding your dream. And it's like literally a weekend conference with a couple hundred people here in Nashville about like how to chase your dream, how to take your big idea and turn it into a business. And I'm really nervous because I have a job. My boss has paid for me to go to this sort of as research, but I kind of also am using it for myself. Right. And, you know, it's just like I'm feeling guilty and everybody seems to have a, like a calling, a purpose, a dream. And they all have these name tags. It's like, hi, my name is so-and-so. My dream is such and such. And I didn't have a dream. And so I like made something up like I'm a storytelling Sherpa. Like, I was just like wanted to say something so vague that like people wouldn't know how, like they wouldn't ask me any questions about it. And there was a point in the seminar right at the beginning where they said, hey, who here doesn't know what their dream is? Raise your hand. And I was very nervous to do this because I felt like the black sheep. And then I started seeing hands pop up in the crowd. And about 60% of the people in the room, they raised their hands saying they didn't have a dream. And so I kind of hesitantly raised my hand. I was like, oh, you know, I'm not alone. And then he said, great, now put your hands down. You're all lying. <laughs> You're lying. Like, oh. He said, you do know what your dream is. You're just afraid to admit it. And I want you to write down whatever the first word that comes to mind is right now. Write down your dream. Whatever comes to mind, don't judge it. Don't think about it. Don't censor it. Just write it down. And I immediately wrote down writer. And I began sharing that with other people because it felt like, wow, I know what my dream is. I shared right. it with my friends and, and they're all like, are you kidding me? We've been telling you that for years, you yeah. know? And you had to go to a seminar to, you know, learn this. And, and I realized, wow, sometimes people in your community, sometimes people who love you, know things about you really before, not before you know them, but before you're willing to admit them to yourself. And that was the first time I realized, oh, I really want to be a writer. And I've wanted to do this for a long, long time. Wow. And I love that story when I heard it, because it did make me think about today and, and where we are in the world right now. There's a lot of people that almost have a little bit more freedom to go after whatever said dream is. Yeah. But I guess I'll ask it to you. Do you feel like that there's still 60% of the world out there that know what their dream is, but they're afraid to really go after it? I don't know how we would measure that. I think a better way to think about that is there was a Gallup poll several years ago where they surveyed the world's workers. And I mean, it was a very extensive survey that happened over the course of several years. And they basically people up into a different, several groups of people. And it was engage, actively engaged in their work, 
engaged, disengaged, or actively disengaged. And they weren't talking about happiness. They're talking about flow, focus, engagement. And, you know, we work for ourselves, right? So we understand what it's like to be motivated to get it done. And there are days where it's like, I'm gonna, I'll go for a walk. I'm gonna right. get, I'm gonna talk, to, I'm gonna call some old friends. I don't know if you do this, guys. I do this. I'm like, today I wasn't super engaged in the work. No, we all have those days. But for the most part, like I'm pretty engaged in what I do because I'm my own boss. And I like, on the days when I'm not, I'm like, man, you were a bad boss to yourself today. You gotta give yourself more work to do. But here's what they found in this study was that when you combined the disengaged means just punching a clock, you know, working in a cubicle, working for the weekend kind of thing. Actively disengaged means like you're throwing wrenches in the system. You're not, you're just not there and you're on your way to getting fired or quit or whatever. Right. And they found that those two groups of people in disengaged and actively disengaged made up 87% of the people that took the survey. 87% of the world's workers based on wow. this study are either disengaged or actively disengaged with their work. Not almost nine out of ten people have you ever gone to a, you know a retail establishment. And you go, hey, how's your day going? And and they go, pretty bad. You know, my boss did this. And I'm like, whoa, I don't, I don't want honesty. Tell me good. Yeah, <laughs> this is sure. depressing me. You know, I thought I wanted the truth, and it's like, oh, I don't want to be in a world. I don't want to live in a world like that. I'm not even so. I would love for everybody to be ha happy with their jobs, but can we just start with like engaged? Like you wake up in the morning and you go, I'm engaged in the work that I'm doing. The person fixing my car, giving me my, you know, checking out my groceries, growing my food, whatever it is, like the things that I rely on other people to do, like that's their job. I would love for them to be like at just a baseline engaged. And that's not the baseline for most people. Right. Disengaged is the baseline for most people. So do most people have a dream? Maybe. But it does seem clear that most people are dissatisfied with where they are vocationally in the world, in their life right now. And I have a friend, a guy named Ben Arment, who says that a dream begins with frustration. Hmm. And I think that's, that's interesting. I think there's some truth to that, that before you know what you want to do, there's a sense that what you're doing right now is not enough, that there's more. There's angst. Right. There's got to be more. I love that because that's like every story. I love stories. That's every hero's journey. Luke Skywalker is going, there's got to be more, right? Right. You know, some, you know, rags to riches story, some kid growing up in the slums or the projects going, not this. There's got to be more for my life than this. Right. Right. And so it's okay to begin a dream with going, I want more and I don't know what it is, but it's not this. And I do think most people feel that. How do people change their baseline? Like, what does that look? Because you said it's disengaged, right? But mm. the baseline should be engaged. So for someone right now that is disengaged and they're listening at this and they are going to a retailer, a big box retailer, and they're back at work. And yeah. now, you know, they didn't figure out their plan over these yeah. last eight weeks while we've been in a pandemic and everything has been shut down. Yep. Or depending on when they're listening at this, how do they change that baseline? I have a friend who says that the story of your life, the story of your life is not your life. It's just a story. So for example, Casanova, can you tell me a story? You just told me a story before we started rolling. Can you tell me a story about your life where I go, your life is a tragedy. You have to tell me your story only using things that would make it a tragedy, a sad story. Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah. And I go, your life is a triumph right? Your life is a heroic story. Can you tell me all the events in your life that make your story a heroic story? Yeah. So when we look at our own lives, the question is, what story do you want to tell? Hmm. And how do you change your baseline? You have to understand that if, if you're living a tragedy right now, and lots of people are, and I totally get that, you continuing to tell yourself this is a tragedy keeps you in that loop of whatever it is of like unhappy relationships, poverty, whatever. And, and so you have to just begin by understanding like I'm reliving the same story. And if at any moment I could believe in something better than my current circumstance, I could change. 
Now, how do we do that? One, we just have to acknowledge that we're telling ourselves a story and it doesn't work to simply change, right? Like if we could just tell everybody's living in poverty right now, just stop telling yourself, you know, I'm going to be poor for the rest of my life, right? Like that doesn't really work. That's hard, but right. they don't believe it. So what you have to do is you have to begin to see another reality as possible. You have to be inspired by someone who looks like you, acts like you, comes from a similar background, or somebody who you can sort of see yourself in. You can see your story in their story. That gives you hope, right? right. That gives you hope. You go, oh, he did it. I think I I'm maybe a little bit smarter than this guy. <laughs> or like, she did it. Like, if she could do it. I can do it. Right. And so we have more control over that than we realize. Uh, this is called positive confirmation bias, right? Like you and I both know people who say stuck in the same patterns. And we, like I do this too. Say, you know, whether it's like health, money, opportunity, relationships, whatever. Like I can't get a date. She, you know, can't get somebody to like me. I can't make more than this much money, whatever. I can only, I can't lose this weight, whatever it is. And and we often find information that confirms the thing that we already want to be true. Hmm. Right? So that's how you right. stay stuck in this pattern. You know, you go, I work with a lot of creative people and they go, you know, I'm always going to be a starving artist. You can't make money doing that. I said, really? You can't make money doing that? Do you want me to live? It doesn't matter what it is. I can fashion, photography, writing, music, acting. You don't have to be Taylor Swift anymore to make a living as a musician. I live in a city full of these people. But half of the musicians in Nashville go, I'm just going to be a starving artist. And they are, right? Whatever story you tell about your life ends up becoming true. Uh, and then there's plenty of people that, are, that I call thriving artists that are making a living off of their art because they saw somebody else do something that they now saw was possible for themselves and they got hope, they were inspired, and then they started searching for more stories like that. And as you do that, you kind of like build up a body of evidence where you go, I can do this. That's right. what I did with writing where I was like, oh, you don't have, you can do this for a living. I kept meeting people uh, that, weren't, that weren't like Stephen King, you know, meeting everyday people, people that I could relate to that we're doing it. And so how you begin to change sort of your base state is one, you have to realize that where you are right now is a result of a story. And it was probably a story that your parents told you and their parents told them, uh, and you now tell yourself. And in order to break out of this story, you've got to tell yourself a new story. And in order to do that, you have to surround yourself with other stories. You have to listen to podcasts like this. You have to see that something's possible. And it's okay to sort of put blinders on and consume a lot of positivity, especially right now when you're so used to talking yourself out of succeeding, spend that energy talking yourself into it. It's possible. Man, that's right there. That's that's the whole podcast. That's all someone needs to hear. That's an amazing clip. And it's just, we tell ourselves these negative connotations all yeah. the time, just like you said. And after a while, just like they, they, the saying goes, if you tell yourself a lie enough, you'll start to believe that it's the truth. Yep. Right? And so if you flip that around and you start to tell yourself that dream, that inspiration enough, you'll start to believe that it's the truth and you'll really have conviction in it. And it's kind of like the saying of, uh, or not a saying, but the story of Jim Carrey. And I'm sure you've heard that where he yeah. said he wrote himself like the $10 million check or $1 yeah. million check. 10 million. Yeah. Yeah. $10 million check. And then, you know, it, it became possible. And I think we oftentimes look at stories for inspiration, but we never look at our own stories for inspiration. Because if we often just look at how far we've already come, regardless of what age you are, this is not your first tragedy that you've had to experience in life. Right. Right? right. This is not the first person that's ever dumped you or whatever, but yet we always diminish the value of our own inspiration and we look at other people's, which I think helps us to, to stay, you know, stay stuck in whatever that, you know, poverty mindset is. Yeah. Consider, I've actually never thought about this before. I think it's fascinating. The loudest voice in your life is your own. Hmm. Nobody is talking to me more than me. Nobody is talking to you more than you. Are you crazy like me? And you always have some sort of narrator narrating always. your life. Always. And he said this and da, 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 and I, I have sweaty armpits now. And so it's like, you get a choice a little bit. Like there's crazy things that go on my head, self-doubt, all kinds of things. I don't like that. But you know, like there's a conversation happening in my head. And the question is like, you have some choice. You have some control over that conversation. 
I think we, I think anybody listening to this podcast probably understands that you don't, that putting yourself around a bunch of negative voices is, is not good for your success. Right. Right. So have you ever paid attention to the voice inside your head? Have you ever spent some time going, what, what, why is he saying all these negative things? Do I have to listen to that? That's a really interesting, one of the ways to break out of limiting mindsets is to realize, to understand that you don't have to listen to every thought that enters your mind. Hmm. You don't have to. That's All kinds powerful. of crazy things come from conditioning and something your grandma said or your teacher said or whatever. Hold on to the good, listen to the good things, and, and you'll start to practice this process. This is what it means to like think positively. It doesn't mean that you force yourself to think about stuff that you don't believe. It means the things that are true, that are rattling around in your head, that excite you, that other people are saying that you're saying to yourself, you believe, you choose to believe and hold on to in the things that aren't true. And sometimes you've got to like, hey man, I, I this thing, I'm thinking this thing, is this true? I remember saying this to a friend one time, I said, I'm afraid that I'm bad at relationships. Hmm. You know, I'm afraid that I, I'm afraid I'm going to hurt people. He said, do you? I go, do I what? He goes, do you hurt people? Are you bad at relationships? I said, I don't think so, but I'm afraid of it. He goes, do you do it? Is that true of you? I said, no. He said, then don't do it. Don't hurt people. Don't be bad at relationships. And he was like calling me out. He's like, you know, don't right. be a victim. Like, this is your life. Is that true of you? No. Then don't believe it. I was like, oh, okay. I'm dwelling on this thought. That's actually not true. I don't have to hold on to it. And just being aware of the fact that this radio station is playing in your head and you get to like tune in or tune out. God. Man, that's that's amazing. I mean, I think that that's the exact thing that we never think about is the loudest voice in our head is often the one that's talking to us all the time, which is ourselves. And you don't have to oh, you can suppress those thoughts, right? And sometimes you, you can train might, it. You can you can train, train that to be more positive. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, what's up, Dream Builder? Have you been getting any value out of this episode? Would you like to get more exclusive content just like this delivered right to your inbox? If so, head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com and you can sign up for the email list and that will give you access to exclusive content and more interviews just like this that's going to be delivered only to our tribe. So head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com. Let's get back to it. For a lot of people right now, they are in a world where they want to become an artist, right? They they feel like let's let's take into a specific situation. There's a lot of people that have a story. They want to tell their story, but yet they're afraid that their story is not impactful enough, right? And I've talked to even my wife about this, the things that she's had to overcome, right? And and the impact that she's had not only on me, but that she can have on many a women. But people are just so fearful of telling their stories that it's not enough. Do you often encounter that? And how, what do you say to people? Yes, I do encounter that. And I have something more to say than your story is good. Go tell it. Because if that were true, it would work and it doesn't work. It doesn't work for you to just run around telling your story. Lots of people try to do that and it doesn't lead to a movement or uh, a message that, that spreads. And the reason for that and I do believe that everybody has a story to share, an idea to spread. Very important. But the reason for that is we don't pay attention to people because their ideas are good or true. We don't pay attention to people because their ideas are good or true. Do I have to let you know that every story that spreads on the internet is not true? Are you aware of the fact that some of the things that the media talks about are not completely accurate and yet we're talking about them? So what does it take to spread a story? We don't pay attention to ideas because they're true or even because they're good. We pay attention to ideas because they're interesting. Hmm. Now, what it means to have an interesting idea is an idea that attacks whatever people take for granted. And that means it has to be surprising and has to be counterintuitive. Do you have so an example? Lots of examples. So uh, there's a researcher by, by, researcher by the name of Murray S. Davis who wrote a paper in 1971 about sociology. It was called That's Interesting. And in that paper, he identifies 12 different phenomena about what it takes to have an interesting idea, right? And an interesting idea is anything where you think it's one way and it's actually another way. So every great religion, 
every political leader who won an election, every great movement, every best-selling book, every slogan that caught in uh, is usually following this framework. Everybody thinks X, but what's actually true is Y, mm. right? So the civil rights movement in many ways was this, Martin Luther King Jr., utilizing, there were lots of people talking about it. He was one of the most effective people in America to, you know, arguably the most effective person to champion that cause. And he used nonviolent resistance, right? Right. Uh, that was, I mean, he and Malcolm X had, you know, disagreed about this. There were lots of, you know, lots of other organizations that were trying to create similar change. He was the most effective at it. He learned this from Gandhi, who employed the same thing and brought the British Empire to their knees. And it was it was surprising. It worked because it was surprising. What do you do when somebody wants to beat you up? You hit them back, right? They didn't do that. But they didn't completely lie down either. And so it was a nuanced way of attacking what people took for granted. And it worked. Jesus launched, arguably, one of the most successful religions of all time, Everybody thinks this. Here's what's actually true. You have heard eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Now I tell you, forgive your enemies, turn the other cheek. These ideas catch on because they're interesting, not because they're true. Hmm. Uh, political leaders, you know, same kind of deal. Make America great again. Is it true? I don't know. No, uh, I'll, I'll save you that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But what does yeah. it do? It, it Here's what it does. It says there was a time when things were better, and we'll bring that time back. Old is new. And you see this all the time. Uh, stoicism is that. There's a big movement towards stoicism today. My friend Ryan Holiday is championing yes. it. Why do we automatically believe that a 2,000-year-old philosophy has any bearing on our life today? It doesn't actually make sense when you break it down, but human beings naturally believe that something that's very old has authority. Hmm. When, when archaeologists discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Christian community, everybody thought that was great because now we have these old documents that prove these things are true. Well, it's just, they're just old, right? It doesn't mean it's not true, and it doesn't mean it is true, but when old is new, new is old, good is bad, bad is good, ketogenic diet, great example. You can show me all the science about keto, right? And I go, oh, that makes sense why that diet works and it caught on. That's not why the diet caught on. The diet caught on because a generation of people like you and me who grew up uh, being told you can't eat butter, you've got to eat margarine, fat is bad for you. Everything, I, I was born in the 80s, everything in the 80s and 90s in our house was low fat, right? And now they tell you, eat butter and bacon and you'll lose weight. Something that I thought was bad growing up, they now told me was good. Right. That's an interesting idea. So if you have a story to tell, tell your story. It's a good story. I'm sure it's wonderful. But you have to make it interesting. And the way to make it interesting is to pick something that your audience, not everybody in the world, but your audience takes for granted and change it up. Huh. Take something that they expect and, and, and take a left turn. Every Malcolm Gladwell book is this way. That if you're familiar with his writing, the tipping point, right, is yeah. about how little things create big change. Little, big. There's contrast there. He wrote a book called David and Goliath about why strength can be a weakness and weakness can be a strength. It's not that these ideas are true. It's that they're interesting. Now, you can get a lot of, in a lot of trouble spreading a bunch of lies that are, that are interesting. They'll right. spread for a little while, and then they'll die down. But with your story, your story is true because it happened. Don't think that just because you have a story to tell, people will listen. There has to be something surprising about it. And I, I, don't make it up, but search for the thing where people think, well, you know, I, you know most people think this about, you know, about about me and my story or somebody like me. And so I've got to do a man, woman, a uh, person of color. Like what is something that my audience would assume is true about me? And then how do I surprise them with the story? Man, I, I love that. And that is so, that's so key. And I love the way you just explained it and everything. There were so many books that was running through my mind. Yeah. And coincidentally, one of the first ones was The, uh, the Outlier by Malcolm Gladwell, right? the 10,000 hours. And yeah. it created that. The other one that comes to my mind is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You know, I, yeah. I, I am a huge Robert Ke And he talked about, you know, go to school, get a good job. And that was what everyone thought. Now he's doing the same thing with, you know, who stole my pension? Because there's so many people right now with like the baby boomers that they're yeah. thinking they got to go to work for someone for 20 some odd years, you get a pension, but it's like, no, that's not 
you know, going to lead you to the promised land. So the way that you broke that down was super beautiful. And, and I am a big fan of stoicism and, and yeah. Ryan Holiday and, and talking about that different world of marketing. But I think so many people, they, they are fearful of that because they don't want to feel inauthentic. Right. Yeah. And they yeah. don't know how far to stretch it to where you where you said, like, are you embellishing or are you completely creating a, a, a facade? Yeah. Well, understand that stories are the way that we make meaning out of experiences. Mm. A story is not true. It is it is a retelling of an event. We know this is true because when you and I finish this interview, I will say it went like this, da, 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 da. and you will say it went like this, da, da, da. and our stories probably won't completely match up because I was experiencing it here in this body and you were experiencing it there in that body and we'll remember different things, Wow! right? And we'll watch the recording and it still won't feel like what it felt like in that moment, right? right? So understand that you may not be embellishing, but you may choose to highlight certain parts of the story for the sake of brevity, for the sake of the audience. And the point of telling a story is not to recount what happened. This is very important. The point of a story is not to recount what happened. The point of a story is to communicate the meaning that that story has to you, to your audience. Wow. Because your story is for you. And if you want to write a book, start a YouTube channel, start a podcast and share your story with the world, that's wonderful. But there's a difference between a book and a journal. I write things in my journal for me to make meaning out of my own experience and understand it better. And uh, I, I put those stories in a book, not to lie or be inauthentic or disingenuous, but to connect those experiences with somebody else's experience. So when you told me your story, you didn't tell me your whole life. You didn't tell me who your third grade best friend was, right? Or, you know, this thing that your grandma said to you when you were 13 or whatever. Like those things are part of your story too. You curated certain events that you thought would be significant to me for the context of, you know, we're going to do a podcast together. And that's great. That's what a storyteller does. Storyteller knows his or her audience and then communicates the story in a truthful but also interesting way. I have a friend who, who says, um, you don't have to tell your whole story to everyone. You have to do that like once or twice. Say you went through a trauma or something, uh, you know, just something that you feel like has to be told. You do that for yourself a few times, maybe even publicly. And it's very cathartic. And then you realize there are pieces of my story that I can communicate in different ways to different groups of people to help them. It's about them. It's about the audience. When you tell your story to the world, it's no longer about you. Your story doesn't belong to you anymore. It is something that you're sharing. It's a story. It's not your life. The story of your life is not your life. So do you lie? No. Do you embellish? No. But you may choose to highlight or focus on certain areas, right? Because again, a really good story goes, you think you're going here and then some surprise happens. Always. Right. right. So- Enjoy the story. Use it to help someone. Use it to help them make meaning out of their own experience. The goal of telling your story to the world is so that somebody can see their story in your story and they make some sort of meaning out of it that transforms their life. That would be wonderful. So you can do that in an honest, genuine way while also utilizing storytelling elements like using like setting somebody up thinking you're going to go one way and then going another way. You did that just, you, you did it intuitively telling me, you know, this, your story really, really powerful. And you can, can continue to implement these tools where you set it up and then surprise people where it stays with them. And now you've got an opportunity to change a life. Man, that, that's so great. And, and why I'm smiling so much and how much context that it has is I had just started in the last week reading uh, by Michael Haig. And I can't remember the other guy, but it's a hero's two journeys. Right. And they talk about that. And I even went as far for anybody listening or watching. I went and watched the video. Basically, Michael Haig and another gal had uh, Will Smith on uh, you and they did basically just like this except it was all three of them and, and they were taught will smith made reference they asked him about his storytelling like how did he become such a great storyteller and they and they go into all of these things but what when you were talking when you said that your life is not the story right the story is not your life and so instantly my mind went into a movie like the pursuit of happiness right and when we looked at that that's an amazing story will smith did a great job but when you look at that if you were to, to pause the movie 35 minutes in, you're like, oh my God, like he's going through some things, but you, that's not the end of it. 
right? You still have another hour and 10 minutes. And so just like you said, there's going to be ebbs and flows. But at the end, what chapter did he want to write? What story did he want to write? And another key point of that is at the beginning of A Hero's Two Journeys, Michael Haig, I believe that's who it is. I can't think of the other guy's name. But he said, if you think about it, any movie or any story is not put in place to teach. It's to spark an emotion right? That then will create change, which is what I've heard you say a right. number of times. So yeah. it all kind of brings it back. And, and it's an amazing point that you make. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that stories are the way that we make meaning of experience. And yeah. so if you tell a story to like teach a point, it often doesn't feel as powerful as like you said, a movie of pursuit of happiness, like pursuit of happiness, where it's like, there's so many lessons that you can get out of that story, which is you know, a true story, right. because they're not trying to teach one lesson. Lessons of perseverance, lessons of love, father-son relationship. I remember telling my old boss about that. And his lesson was, you know, that guy, I was scared. I watched that movie. I was starting a family. I was like, I don't want this to happen. I need, you know, I was scared. And he was like, well, that guy had like no, you know, nothing to fall back on, you know? So the lesson there is have something to fall back on. So it's just like, well, you know, I didn't get that out of the story. So there's so many things you can get out of one story and I have a friend who's a rabbi and he talks about the Torah, you know, the scripture being a 70 faceted diamond. You know, you have these stories of Abraham and Isaac and all these prophets. And he says, you know, you've got one story, you know, very simple story. And there's 70 different ways to look at it. And, and the job of, he said, the Jewish community is to keep turning the diamond, right? And so we, we take a, you can take, do a movie, a book, right? And you go, Here's one facet. Here's one side of it. One thing that I see on it. I go, I see something else. Let's turn it a little bit. And, and they're all true. And so your, the story of your life is just a story. It's the way that you make meaning out of it. And your life is not just a story, but story, the understanding of story, as you said, helps you understand your life, right? right. A life, the point of a life, if it's a story, is not to be just a bunch of happy-go-lucky, positive moments. And right. so one of the things that I take great comfort in is if I'm in a really sucky part of my life and I look at it as a story, I go, oh, this is good. Something really big is about to happen. And right. it's true. It often happens true. that way. And you can use a struggle, a tragedy, and still be in the moment, still be kind of sad or frustrated or whatever, but also get a little bit excited. I get a little bit giddy sometimes. It's still in my pain and fear. I go, right. oh, I can sense it. Something good is going to follow this. I'm going to learn. I'm going to grow. Transformation is coming, coming, and I don't know how. It's an exciting story. I love that. And, and that makes you think of why certain people, maybe even subconsciously, they're thinking that way because you see that there's pain and certain people just smile. And you're like, wow, how are you smiling in a crazy time like this? And mm -hmm. I think because they think that same way, man, something great's about to happen. And I know one of the things that I've always said to myself, you know, even through the times of cancer, through whatever else is joy wouldn't feel so good if it wasn't for pain. Mm. Right. And so we never think about that because in the moment we think that, man, our life is so bad. Like, how can we come back from it? And then I don't think, again, like I said earlier, I don't think that we give ourselves enough credit once we're out of it. We become just so immune to like us being able to bounce back. But if you think of it in that way, like, man, something great's about to happen. I think that that's going to pull you even quicker out of that slump. And I think that's an amazing way to think about it. And I know from here on out for the rest of my life, I would definitely always think of that. So thank you. Uh, for me, at least, but I'm sure there's so many other people that are going to get value out of this. That's that's an amazing point. You've talked about Malcolm Gladwell. You've talked about Ryan Holiday. You've talked about some great, great people. Is there one person that you turn to for inspiration or insight just to try to level up your mindset? One person that comes to mind, I'll tell you who you remind me of, but after you say it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I, I don't know if this feels like a throw answer. It's legitimately true in the season of life that I'm in right now, which is that I mentioned my son, Aiden. He's eight years old. I've got a son and a daughter, eight and four. But like a few years ago, I started calling Aiden my guru because mm -hmm. I would ask him questions like completely innocently and seriously. Like, do you believe in God? You know, or like, is there something wrong with you? like existential philosophical questions. And I, as his father, was not trying to teach him something. I was trying to learn from him. And one of the most remarkable conversations we ever had was when I asked him if there was something wrong with him. I grew up with a lot of trauma, abuse, shame, 
just stuff, you know? And, and then I made it my mission to succeed because I thought that was going to fix everything. And I realized even in my success, I was still carrying around this image of myself as somebody who was broken and, and that I was going to have to work. If I, if I was going to be okay inside, I was okay on the outside, you know, I was making money and people thought I was cool on the inside. I still felt broken. I still felt alone and like something was wrong with me. And so I was just curious, you know, here's my, at the time, my six-year-old son, this is, you know, sort of the identity formation age for kids. So sort of they start to form their personality and you can still kind of change and grow from there. But a lot of things get set at that age. And I always had this toxic shame growing up. I just felt bad. I felt like a bad kid. You he wish what? that your parents would have asked you that at a young age, that maybe it would have allowed you to figure out that you weren't broken? I wish my parents would have provided uh, an environment where I didn't have to assume that was true. I don't think that the question creates the security. I think the environment does. And that just, you know, wasn't possible. So I'm, I'm grateful for, you know, how I grew up and all the things I got out of that. And, and that was a thing that I, you know, had to work through. And so I was just curious what my son's experience was. Like, is this just a, a thing? You know, I said, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what's wrong with you? But like, what's wrong with you? Tell me something that's wrong with you. We're eating chips and guacamole at Chipotle. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, is there anything wrong with you? He goes, no. I was like, oh, thank God. And I said, so you're perfect. He said, what does that mean? And I said, well, it means there's nothing wrong with you. He said, I always thought it meant that you didn't mess up. And I said, no, buddy, I don't think so. I think it just means there's nothing wrong with you. And he said, oh, well, I guess I'm pretty perfect then. And he started eating some chips right. again. I love it. And, and I mean, that messed with me so much. Because if you ask me what's wrong with me, I got a big long list for you. Right. And the original meaning uh, of the word perfect, which comes from a couple of different languages, including French, parfait means perfect, is complete. The original sort of middle age meaning definition of the word is not pristine. It's not without flaw. It's complete. And uh, I love the fact that at six years old, my, my son didn't feel like he was missing anything, but he wasn't lacking anything in himself, that he was whole as, as an Aiden, as a human being. So yeah, no joke. Like I learn a lot from my kids. I've got plenty of, of heroes and, and people I look up to, but I'm so fascinated with their innocence. And it's, you know, it's starting to dwindle a little bit as they get older, <laughs> but I just, I love seeing the world through their eyes because there's so many conditioned adult patterns that I have that I don't even know why I'm doing it. Like the other day we were at the park and they wanted to wade. We were just wearing regular clothes and they wanted to wade through the Creek. And I was like, no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. Well, why not? Let's get yeah. wet and muddy. Let's do it. And we did it. It was amazing. And I'm like, I'm learning so much through their innocence that I'm reconnecting with uh, that I love. Yes. I love it too, man. We're in the same boat. I mean, my son's almost nine and I think yeah. that he's, uh, he's so much smarter than I ever was. And he has so much personality. And my daughter is even on a higher level just for the fact that she's two going on 12. And I'm sure you know yeah. how that goes. Yeah. But I love that you said that. One thing that, you know, for me, I grew up seeing a lot of trauma, just like you. Yeah. One thing that I'm always conscious of is how can I make, how can I one be What's the word that I'm looking for? How can I be non-judgmental of yeah. my son, right? How can I allow him to Love be that. the best him that he could be, no matter what it is? And I've had these talks with friends and my wife, and we're constantly talking about this, especially being in a biracial marriage and having a biracial family. Yeah. The one thing that you said was it wasn't the most conducive environment to allow me to understand that I was complete or perfect. What does that environment look like if someone else is listening or watching this right now and they're saying, how can I create that environment for my child? Yeah, I mean, lots of the environment that's not going to be good for your kids. And this is true. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but I understand that when something is wrong in the environment, if it's an environment of chaos, kids are natural narcissists. And I mean that in a, a positive way, meaning they tend to think whatever, whatever's going on in the world is because of them. Things are bad, I'm bad. Things are good, I'm good. So it doesn't matter so much what you say to your kids, I have found, as much as it matters the environment that you create. Can we create an environment of peace, 
of respect, not perfection, and uh, you know, stability where they understand kind of what the day is going to look like. My environment growing up was very chaotic. You never knew what was going to happen. The cops might come, somebody might leave, something might break. It was just there was some chaos. So now, and, and I'm working through that, but the way that I've gone through the world is very nervously, very anxiously. And so I don't know what your experience Casanova has been, but it's like, I just got to do something. I got to do something. I got to clean something. I got to achieve something. I got to, I got to, I got to eat something. I got to drink something. I got to do something. Calm, chill. No, I don't know how to do that. So I put a lot of that energy into achievement, which allowed me to succeed. And the world said, hey, good job. Good job for being anxious. And I'm like, okay, all right. I got to do more things. Got to level up, make more money. And that comes from chaos. And it's so interesting to watch my kids who are, my son is very competitive. He's very athletic, loves to win, getting into video games now. Um, Like doesn't like to play something that he can't be the winner at, but he's like a pretty chill dude too. Like, he can just relax. And I have realized how hard it is for me to relax. He and I had a conversation recently and oh, we were watching a movie, we're watching like a, a Pixar movie and it was about a, a father-son relationship and the son, it was onward and the son wanted to be yes. like the dad. And I jokingly sort of tease it. I was like, do you, do, you want, do you want to be that? We totally joke about this. You know, my, my pseudo internet fame, like once a year, he has to do a book report on a famous person where he teaches the class about, you know, some famous person. And he did like Johann Sebastian Bach and he did Walt Disney. And I was like, this year, are you going to do, are you going to do me? He's like, no, I'm going to do like a real famous person. <laughs> I knew that was your brain. He's like, no. <laughs> so I was, so we were watching this movie and I was sort of teasing him again because I, I don't care. It's, it's just fun. I said, do you want to be like me? Is it, do you want to do, do that? He goes, no. I go, oh, really? He goes, I go, who do you want to be like? He goes, I want to be me. And, and then not too long ago, we were, we were talking and I said, you're so cool. Like, really? You're such a cool kid. I, I want to be like you, man. He goes, daddy, don't, don't do that. Be yourself. Mm. It's just like totally earnest, very sincere. And it's like, that, so, you know, how do you do that? You know, I, I don't know. I think you and I both would agree. Like there comes a point where you're like, I didn't do that. Like that kid is special and it's amazing. And I just don't want to screw it up. Right. Uh, but I do think one of the best things that we can do as parents, as I understand it, is provide as stable and as secure an environment and connection with your kids as possible. And I'm just so, I, I don't judge them. You know, there's consequences and rules and all those things, but I am so curious about them. And, and, and the best practices that we've cultivated is being able to talk about your emotions. It's okay to feel them, share them, whatever. And I want to hear what you think about something. Like I actually want to hear it. And I may, I may try to shape that a little bit, but for the most part, I'm very open to letting my kids think and believe and do the things that they want to do and just encourage what seems to me to be natural gifts and proclivities and like, you know, the main rule is don't hurt anybody, right? If you hurt right. somebody, I've got to remove you from the situation. But there's plenty of things that I let the kids work out between themselves because I, I trust them. Right. Uh, and and my job as a parent is not to just kind of hover in there and make sure they make all the right choices because that is is often very dangerous, but rather to create an environment of stability, love, support, you know what's going to happen. There's some sense of structure without it being too structured. Those things were not necessarily things that I had that create a lot of anxiety in me. And everybody's different. Everybody adapts differently to their, their environments. And, and those are things that in some ways we sort of accidentally created. That wasn't like super intentional. It was just like, we love these kids. We want them to do well in life. Right. And a lot of good things just come out from a sense of I'm loved and, and you know, all is right. I'm loved, I'm safe, and all, all is right in the world. Man, I love it. I love it, man. This has been a phenomenal episode, and I can't say thank you enough. There's somebody out there that is just as inspired as I am, and, you know, they love your path. They love how you, you know, really honed in on who you are, your creativity, and, and really just your knowledge, and they want to blaze a path for themselves just like you, but they have that little voice in their head, the little voice that we all know that says you're not strong enough, you're not smart enough, or maybe you just don't have enough resources to do what Jeff has done. What's the one thing that you say to that person to get them to just take action? Mm. Mm. 
I think a lot of suffering in life comes from resisting reality. Hmm. We think if we don't resist something, we have to give in to it. And the truth is the only way for something to not have power over you is to accept it. Now, acceptance is the first step to actually overcoming anything, right? So if you have, you know, a learning disability to, I have a friend who has a learning disability and he spent his whole life pretending he didn't have a learning disability. And, and he said, it stunted my growth because I couldn't accept this. And, and I adapted in different ways, but I couldn't accept it. And at some level, you have to accept reality in order to work with reality. Uh, so what I would do with that voice of doubt is say, thank you. I hear you. Now, please step aside. We have work to do. You can listen and not have to pay attention. You, you are the one, not the voice. You are not the voice. You are the one who gets to decide if we keep watching this movie, if we keep listening to this radio station that says you're a loser or not. And you don't have to know. You don't have to fight it. You don't have to know what's on the other side of that. You can simply go, thanks, fear, self-doubt. Uh, anger, whatever voice is coming up. Thank you. I hear you. Now, please move aside. We have work to do. There's something that I, the one in charge, there's something I want to do and we don't need your help. There you have it. I love it, man. For anybody who wants to stay connected with you, we will have many links in the show notes, but where can they find you at? You go to my website, follow all my stuff. I have a podcast, blog, weekly newsletter, goinswriter.com, G-O-I-N-S, writer.com. And I love connecting with people on Instagram. It's the place where I'm most active. You send me a DM, I'll read it and respond. And that's just at Jeff Goins, J-E-F-F-G-O-I-N-S. Got it. All right, my man. Well, we look forward to having you on the show again. And remember, Dream Nation, and the dream we trust, but we must take action. Otherwise, it will only merely be a fantasy. We'll see you on the next one. That's all we got for this episode. Thank you for sticking around. That truly means a lot to me. And hopefully that means that we delivered massive value on this one. If you haven't already, the way that you could say thank you to myself and the team is just by heading over to iTunes and leaving a review and a rating. That's what iTunes loves to see. That's how we get out there even more. And I would definitely, definitely be grateful for it. I know the team would as well. Do me a favor and head on over to dreamnationpodcast.com. That's where you're going to be able to find all of the resources that we talked about in today's episode, as well as more exclusive content. And you'll also be able to sign up to our email list where we have more exclusive content. And we always love to hear the feedback from you all because you're our tribe. So remember, in the dream we trust, we'll see you on the flip side.